Hey there, folks. Welcome to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My guest today is Donna Laughlin, who is the president of LMG PR. Donna, what's happening today? Oh, my gosh. I'm staying cool in the Silicon Valley. It's super hot. We get close to 90 and uh, I'm just going to like, you know, enjoy hanging out in my in my cool office and and uh, catch up on all things tech and the happenings of the world. Awesome. Thanks, Ray. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I really enjoyed our, our pre-conversation listeners. I hope that you are equally cool. Or if you're in a hot place, I hope it's by design and you're, you get to kind of sit in, relax for today's conversation. So Donna, why don't you let our listeners know about you know what you do, whether that's on two wheels, four wheels, around the world, what keeps you busy and engaged on most days? Yeah, well, a lot. You know, I, I've had my PR agency for 20 years, um, which specializes in emerging tech. So I, I do robotics companies and transportation and agriculture and anything that is smart and kind of like moving on two, four or flying, um, I work with. But uh, prior to that, I, I worked in a number of Silicon Valley companies, taking them from zero to market heroes. Uh, and that included uh, infrastructure, cybersecurity, um, in, in, internet uh, platform companies, consumer tech companies. And before that, I was a news reporter. So um, I started my career as a news reporter and business and, and economics, and that migrated into technology. And I, my father always said, you know, you can, you can be a good to great writer, but have something that you can talk about. And so um, I was in the business kind of, fin, you know, what we can now call fintech world for a bit. And that migrated me into the, the deep tech world. And, and where I I'm from originally is the Silicon Valley, but it was known as the land of heart's delight, which was farming and agriculture. So hmm. it's kind of interesting. Um, you hear a lot of people talk about, you know, working at home. I actually went from starting my business, you know, at home and, and then built, you know, my agency. And the last couple of years, I didn't have any challenge realigning and being agile of, kind of splitting my time between my physical office and my home office. And my clients are all over the world. And so I think it's one of the things about technology and the businesses I work with is that with technology, we can actually be elastized and remote and still communicate like you and I are. Yeah, I love that. So um, if we think of obviously like Silicon Valley, deep tech being on the forefront, you know, those uh, emerging technologies for people to understand them, to adopt them, to be part of them, critically important. If we think of the shift in marketing over the past 20 years or so, you know, moving from uh, non-digital to digital now, like super targeted. And then I imagine there's a world of like old school PR. If we took it, all of that, intersected it into 2022, what do you see the, the future, I guess maybe the present in the future of PR and, and why is PR in itself critical for organizations to be successful, whether they're or in tech or outside of tech? Yeah, well, two fundamental things we can't take out of uh, out of the digital age that are still important in PR and, and marketing are ethics and integrity. And so we need to be able to tell a, what I call a thought provoking relevant story. And we need to keep an eye on what's happening, not just within the corporate story and in your product, but what trends are happening. You know, is the market dynamics changing? Um, are we in the middle of some form of, you know, energy crisis or is the stock down or did a product not work as advertised from one of your competitors? Uh, looking at the competitive landscape and also looking at what your customers have to say about your product. So there's a huge ecosystems of things that need to be looked at thoughtfully and and I would say um, proactively because there's when, any time that you need to respond to a, 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 cr a crisis or something preventative, you should always think about the worst case scenario in advance. And so I take my clients through a narrative story process. And if I'm working with them from the very beginning and launching their product, I really like to get to know why they started the company. What was that? That, that curiosity or that discovery process that they actually said, you know what, I'm going to create, you know, a smart deep tech tractor, or I'm going to create a, um, a product pre-pandemic that actually could, you know, reduce germs and contamination and things like that pre-pandemic. And we think people were doing these things before the pandemic, right? And 
And so going through that process of discovery and looking to see, oh, the places we can go, um, where are the market opportunities? What is the, you know, the background of, of the founders and where is the, you know, what kind of impact, you know, and benefits. So, but it really starts with, you know, being able to have an authentic, and I, and I say, and the, keeping the integrity uh, and the ethics in that discussion. Uh, digital age is, but for the most part, just speeds everything up, right? Mm -hmm. I can have a conversation with an editor and five minutes later, the, the article could go live. Uh, and that's a little hard to pull. <laughs> you know, it's not like taking newspapers and shredding them in the back room. Yesterday, I saw the last public pay phone was, that was uh, ripped, and, ripped and torn out of Manhattan in New York City. And it kind of, it kind of crushed me for a moment because not that I've been hanging out at phone booths, but that we've, we've, it doesn't exist anymore. It's not in, it's, it's not in our social norm. We're all highly connected and we're, we're always connected. And recently I went on a business trip and I left my phone in an Uber ride for the next 48 hours It's disconnected and unplugged from the world. I immediately went on and dialed into literally a dial up janky airport internet, which I know is not secure and not that, you know, speed is lightning, but I needed to log in and get connect to my Uber to alert them that I left my phone in the car. Fortunately, within 20 minutes, they were able to identify, contact him, and he emailed me. I emailed him back. Of course, I had a two-level set authentication code. So first they wanted to text me, which I couldn't do. So I had to figure out how to bypass that going through several levels with them. And I was unplugged for 48 hours. And what I learned from that was it's okay. I actually, my, my brain waves were actually being recharged. My, my phone was going to be dead when I got it, but my brain waves were recharging. My creativity was recharging. And I was able to sit in an, an airport um, terminal area for, I don't know, I think I had like two hours before my connecting flight. And I wrote, and I wrote some of the most prolific things I think I've written in a long time because I didn't have any distractions. My phone came back 48 hours. And when I plugged it in, it lit up like a Christmas tree or like Times Square, whatever. And I thought, wow, people missed me. And my messages were anything from, are you okay? Where are you? Did you see my email? Did you see my email and my Slack and my, and my team's message? And I think that's one of the things that's changed is the high touch is that, that we don't have one platform of choice, it seems. We text, we Slack, we email. We um, use other platforms, third-party platforms like Trello. Um, I try to school uh, my clients to use maybe two of those options uh, for productivity. It's really hard to go in and out. But I think in terms of establishing that protocol is really important for communications internally. And you also have to keep in mind in the outside world when communicating with media, they're not necessarily using those platforms. So I always say, start with something old fashioned, pick up the phone and have a conversation. So when I saw that the phone booth being ripped out, that's why I said it kind of tugged at my heart screams and strings going, oh my goodness, what if you didn't have a mobile phone? And what if you didn't, like in my situation, I could even call Uber to get an Uber when I got back to town because I didn't have a phone and there's no phone at the airport. There's no phone booths at the airport. So I had a really nice businessman um, who called the, the called for me and arranged for an Uber, <laughs> but I could have gone back online to an unsecured network, but I didn't want to do that again. So just taking it back into like, obviously huh, we don't have the same tools that we did in the past. We have, perhaps an overwhelmingly large amount of tools for communication now. Uh, storytelling is still critical at the part of that, but I think the undertone of that is, you know, you might not be able to reach everywhere, everybody all the time where you want, especially if you're trying to, you know, develop that awareness for your business. And then recognizing that it is that kind of omni-channel experience with everything that you're doing and then kind of going backwards around the why PR is, you know, sharing the why of what it is versus the what of what it is in a way that has integrity so that you can communicate 
I guess, what's really important about the business. So there was a lot of different themes there unpacked in a couple of stories, but hopefully I tried to capture most of that. Well, and the thing is that storytelling is oral, right? And so with, and you can still tell a story uh, one-on-one, right? And you and I have a conversation. If you want to amplify that, then the digital age helps us do that, which is great. I think that um, I'll give an example from years ago. I was at a, a corporate event for an unveiling of the brand new building. It was in Manhattan. And one of the portions of it was to do the circle line tour in, in, you know, in the Bay. And one of the executives wanted to have a very flashy, super digital kind of presentation, wanted it fully scripted and wanted to be, you know, very formal. And I said, you know, I actually disagree. I think that you, we've had some challenging times with the company. We've had, uh, we had a, a couple of, of down rounds and we also had some people that were let go. Um, the competition was pretty fierce and people were feeling like they needed to hear something more soulful. So I said, I'm going to actually, you can have your backdrop and we're going to strip it down because you need to speak from the heart. And I think that's when stories actually speak to us, whether it was a bedtime story when you were a child, or if it was a, a, a book that you, you know, read or a business uh, how-to book or, or, or self-help book, or you're writing, you know, a thesis project. You need to know who your audience is. You need to be able to listen and not just respond. And he wasn't listening. He wasn't listening to the, the, the employees and what they needed. And I tuned into that and I said, you're going to be a superhero if you do it this way. <laughs> and, and you're going to, and it's going to be a big fail if we do it the other way, because the way that he wanted to do it, he wasn't even going to be physically in the room. Hmm. He was going to be in another room and there was going to be 500 plus people watching him on video. I'm like, no power to the people. We got to, we got to go back to, you know, the old school and, and it was highly effective. And in that room were investors, the company got more funding and they saw that, you know, the, the investing in the people that were in the room, in this case, there were a lot of people. Um, but that's, that's the power of a story. Uh, politicians do it really well. Uh, I'm probably the most apolitical person, <laughs> not, but politicians do it really well when it comes to trying to pull us in, right? Trying to um, allure us in. I think, uh, you know, the, the Irish, you know, oral stories, uh, and the folkloric stories that um, that a lot of us were exposed to, you know, growing up, regardless where in the world you are. I mean, I've had um, a collection of folkloric stories, you know, from from uh, Asian uh, countries. Japan particularly has some amazing stories, you know, with the Greek mythology and all these. And there's a reason why they're still around, is because they still hold their own. And I think if you're going to capture and hold your own to your audience, you need to kind of, as I said, listen. I also tell people to look up and not down. We're all running around looking at our phone. So when I was at the airport that day, and when I got to my next destination, I have a digital device to, to dink around with. So I observed and I watched people. It was almost like being back in Japan, where you don't talk on the phone and you don't interact publicly that way. And there was something very kind of cathartic and I say very creative that was going through my curiosity was, I, I know I didn't have, um, my mind wasn't polluted, <laughs> so to speak. And what I've learned from that is since I got my phone back and my phone is like right now where we're chatting is off and it's in another room. It's not here with me. It's not as a distraction. I also get into my car and I turn it off. Like music is good to drive to do. You can listen and kind of inspire. I used to get in my car. I start making my phone calls, driving to my office. I'd go in my office and I just continue one continuous thread. And so what I found was displacing my phone was actually a really good leadership technique for me because it allowed me to just kind of like realign. It's like a chakras, right? <laughs> We're realigned. Got it. So uh, one other thing, I had a question about just that communication 
piece, uh, especially around, you know, the CEO who was explaining, doing that storytelling and, and you had to say, hey, like, think about it this way, which is why, you know, you're in the job that you have. What do you say to leaders, CEOs or otherwise, who might have a fear of transparency? And I know it's kind of like an evolution of, of trust and, and kind of, you know, the change of work in 2022, like there's a lot more transparency and openness and kumbaya that some people might call it. Mm. But what do you say to people who have an aversion to transparency that don't want to say too much for whatever reason? Um, how do you coach them through that? How do you support them in being effective communicators when they might have a hesitancy in terms of what to say? Yeah, well, I, I'm not afraid to ever tell, work with my clients and in, in telling them what they need to hear versus what they might want to hear. Um, <laughs> so a big part of PR is to ensure the company's reputation and their evaluation is, uh, it, it, you know, is, is solid. So if, uh, if the conversation is, you know, is one which if you're too transparent and it's not going to externally benefit you, then you probably want to dial it back. Um, and I've had some, I work with some uh, companies that actually want to be extremely transparent and everything is, you know, is on the, you know, is off the record and we don't work in an off the record world and transparency with the media sometimes can actually be a, a bad thing, particularly if you're a publicly traded company. Editors have a job and their job is to report. You can't, it's really hard to retract what you just said. If you just said everything is, you know, is, is, is open and free. But I, I think for the most part, uh, people want to do good in terms of, you know, communication. You don't want to tank your stock. You don't want to lose your funding. You don't want to, you know, lose your, your talent. Right. And I think one of the, the things that I've seen in the past couple of years is a lot more empathy. Um, people are working from home, working in a hybrid scenario. I have employees that, are working at home and they're working, I think, even more creatively and more smarter, you know, than they were before. And they were already amazing. Right. And so I think that's kind of opened up, you know, some of the, the mindset, but I think transparency is a judgment call. We need to know where the boundaries are and it mm -hmm. depends on cultures as well. American companies have a tendency to be, you know, very heavily marketed you go to other countries and, and or I oftentimes work with companies that the market, they create and design their products in other countries, but their market is the United States. But I've also done the reverse engineering and I've marketed products in Israel, marketed products in Australia, marketed products in, in parts of Asia, um, Canada, other, um, even if I go to the deep South demographically and you know the response to a product could be very different in New York City or in, or in Idaho, right? So really being aware, situational awareness, I think is really important. Um, I fly, I'm really in tune to situational awareness. When we drive, we need to be situationally aware. And I think that same instinct is also needs to be part of the corporate leadership, you know, situationally aware of what's happening within tune to the market and your people, but take that into your storytelling as well. As you talk about the company, your products, um, your, your showcase, your customers and focusing on the impact and, and not the, the I and impact doesn't mean I just about, you know, my, myself, but the impact in which it can have, she have an infinity and beyond is really what I like to think is the I and impact should be. Yeah. So what I'm taking away from that is, you know, your ability to, to listen as much as P PR is there is to be able to listen and respond to what's happening in the marketplace, to have your head up, to be aware. And I think good listeners, as we've talked about, uh, are, are in tune what's happening around them, not just in their companies, but in the market. And then as it relates to that communication, openness and transparency, you know, we do live in an on the record world uh, where they have, you know, you can have it's something you say can and will be held against you. So being aware of, of how to use that uh, effectively, but also managing, you know, connecting with people through that. Uh, just la last question for you here. When should our uh, listeners, if they're in, in business running organizations, when should they add PR to their kind of market mix? If they've been doing traditional marketing, at what point would you say, hey, you know, PR is something for you to consider and, to, and adding that to their existing kind of communication strategy? Yeah, new companies that have uh, not launched or just coming out of uh, their, their cotillion, so to speak, I traditionally start working with them six months to a year uh, when they actually have their 
their funding uh, is helpful. Sometimes I actually give them a little bit of a jump start when I uh, program. Uh, where I help get them maybe five pieces of flair, significant articles that are going to help them get over that hurdle to get that funding um, and be able to kind of amplify their conversation. But most the, most times the product's in development and maybe it's the first, you know, the first release, uh, whether it's something you put in your pocket, your house or, or your car, or it is a car, um, six months, usually you'll have um, six you know, months to a year, you'll have a prototype and you'll have some betas. Uh, they don't have betas and I work with them in developing the betas and the messaging and the positioning. And then we start the, the process of testing it. So how do we test it? We talk to market analysts. We talk to, we create an influencer group. And I don't mean social media influencers. I mean, people who are actually, um, you know, they're artificial intelligence expert or they're a transportation, um, you know, uh, reviews uh, person or um, they, you know, they're an expert on sustainability or some form of research data that we can use. So that typically is, you know, six months to a year. And then we go into the next phase, which is talking to the media, uh, which there's monthly and long leads, which anything that has, you know, three to four months before it goes to print. And then we have the very fast and furious digital world that we've been talking about in which it could happen within, you know, hours and, and, and weeks. Um, and so there's a, a tiered approach, you know, for, for that process. Then it, there goes, we go into the, you know, so we, we launched a company and then we go through the process of, okay, we launched, now what? Um, you have to keep listening to, you know, see, test the messages, see what worked. Um, an article in Bloomberg is a very different set of core messages than say something like a Wired magazine, a CNUT, or even like a Popular Mechanics or sometimes even Vanity Fair or Men's Health. Um, those publications all need different a different set of you know message points. So working through that process, working with directly with the customers and keeping an eye on the competition. And so the elasticity, you know, I would say there's like a, the elasticization of your 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 stories needs to you know evolves over time. So there's no one set standard way of doing it. It just depends where the customer, where the company and their and their products are within the marketplace. I like to get them really raw personally so that I can like have a clean canvas and and being able to uh, work on the positioning, the messaging, and and, and roll them out. Got that. Uh, what, what I really appreciate about it is, a, at least for me, a different way of thinking about PR as in, hey, let's not just put our, our like our name out there broadly, but especially in the context of new companies, uh, new tech, new products is within the, the, you didn't say influencers, but call it experts, media experts and saying, hey, these are the people like, let's see how they are receiving us. So you can kind of get a stress test uh, and a litmus test as to how it's doing as you do that, that product rollout. So it's a really good way to think about it. Because I think a lot of people think of PR saying, hey, we're going to market what we have or share what we have, whereas there is a good way for, for market validation. So very cool, it's, Donna. Uh, it's not the period at the end of the sentence. I always tell people, you know, it's <laughs> press releases are formality. I'm, I, I, I'm editorial driven, yeah. not press release driven, which makes a difference. And the podcast that I host before it happens, that's what I really talk about is the entrepreneur's journey of going to that process when they decided they, they were, that was it. They were going to mortgage their, their, their house or sell their car or trade their dog down to a cat or something. <laughs> and but basically it's that journey of discovery and telling their story, yeah. which is a lot of fun. Awesome. Uh, where can people find out about that podcast? Where can they learn more about the work that you do? Yeah, it's uh, before it happens show. You can find it, uh, on Instagram very quickly on the, the latest episodes. And it's on all the major uh, podcast plat platforms, Apple, Spotify, um, Google, uh, all the places that anyone wants to go uh, it's just before it happened. Uh, and then I'm on LinkedIn. It's one of the favorite places I hang out when I don't have my phone on is uh, LinkedIn, uh, just as Donna Laughlin, and that's L-O-U-G-H-L-I-N. And the business site is lmgpr.com, which stands for leadership momentum and growth, which is what we want to aspire for with great stories. Awesome. I appreciate that, Donna. Thank you so much for the time today. Uh, I'm going to really take in uh, notice when I'm looking down and keep my head up to be aware of what's going on and, and be a better listener to people. So thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Folks, my guest today, Donna Laughlin, who is the founder and president at LMG PR. 
So as you evolve in your day, hopefully you don't have to leave your phone in an Uber to recognize that there's stuff going around around you that you pay attention to, but do have your ears open, not only for opportunities, but for your people so that you can communicate efficiently, earnestly, and really get your message across effectively. So once again, my name is Anthony Taylor. This has been the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. It's been a pleasure being with you today, and I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.